we know we don't want to check all values of x individually. This would just be the classical algorithm. In that case, the quantum algorithm wouldn't be any better. The magic of quantum computing is that the state of our system doesn't have to be a classical state. It can be a superposition of classical states. And if we apply the operator O to a superposition of classical states, it's as if we were checking all of those values that make up the superposition simultaneously. So to check all possible values of x at once, we want to apply the operator O to the uniform superposition S. And remember, we can create the uniform superposition S from the state 0 by applying a Hadamard gate to each of the qubits. Because O is a linear operator, applying O to the uniform superposition is the same thing as applying O to each of the basis vectors individually and then summing up the results. O leaves almost all of the basis vectors unchanged, so we almost end up with S again, with the exception that O negates the amplitude of the basis state X star. So the result of applying O to S is 1 over root 2 to the n, uh, that coefficient that all of the basis vectors share. And then times, we're summing over all values of x except for x being equal to x star. And then subtracting the basis vector x star because it has its amplitude negated when O acts on it. So you may be thinking that we're done now and that Grover's algorithm is super simple. We can just grab the basis vector that has negative 1 over root 2 to the n as its amplitude. Unfortunately, in quantum computing, we don't get to see the full state the system is in. The only way we can get any information about the system is when we make a measurement. And in that case, we just observe one basis vector. And for this state, the probability of finding the system to be in the state x star upon measurement is just going to be negative 1 over root 2 to the n squared or 1 over 2 to the n, which is the same probability of finding the system to be in any of the other basis states upon making a measurement. So we might as well have just made a measurement on the uniform superposition. And this brings up the question, is it possible to tell these two states apart? One where we have the uniform superposition and one where we have the uniform superposition except the coefficient on front of one of the basis vectors is negated. And of course it is, otherwise Grover's algorithm wouldn't exist. So let me show you how it is in the case of a single qubit system where the uniform superposition consists of the sum of two basis vectors. So let's say that x star is equal to 1. So the two states we're trying to tell apart are 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1, namely the uniform superposition for a single qubit, and 1 over root 2, 0 minus 1, which is the uniform superposition except the coefficient of the basis vector x star has been negated. Now, if you were paying attention to the video on quantum gates, you'll recognize, of course, that the first state, the uniform superposition, can be written as the Hadamard gate acting on the basis state 0. That's because the Hadamard gate creates the uniform superposition when it acts on the basis state 0. And the second state is actually the Hadamard gate acting on the state 1. Now you may also remember that the Hadamard gate is its own inverse. So applying it twice is the same thing as doing nothing at all. So if we apply the Hadamard gate to this first state, the result is just going to be the basis vector 0. And if we apply the Hadamard gate to the second state, the result will be the basis vector 1. And if we make a measurement on a system that's in the state 0, we're guaranteed, that is with probability 1, 
to find that system to be in the state zero. And if we have a system that's in the state one, if we make a measurement on that system, we'll find that system to be in the state one. So if we apply a Hadamard gate to a qubit that's in the first state and then measure that qubit, we're guaranteed to find that qubit to be in the state zero. And if we apply a Hadamard gate to a qubit in the second state, followed by a measurement, we're guaranteed to find that qubit to be in the state one. So in this case, we can tell these two states apart. All we have to do is apply a Hadamard gate to the unknown state and then make a measurement. And that'll tell us what state we were in. Now I wanna illustrate this using IBM's quantum experience. But first, let me introduce a new gate that will allow us to do this negation of the coefficient in front of the basis state one. This gate is a sibling of the poly X gate. It is the poly Z gate. There's also a poly Y gate, by the way. When it acts on the basis vector zero, it leaves it unchanged. And when it acts on the basis vector one, it produces negative one times the basis vector one. So I wanna look at two different situations. With both of them, the qubit starts in the basis state zero, as it always does at the beginning of a computation. And then we're going to put it in the uniform superposition by applying a Hadamard gate to it. Now in case one, we're gonna follow this first Hadamard gate with a second Hadamard gate and then make a measurement. And we should find the qubit to be in the state zero. And in the second case, we're going to follow the first Hadamard gate with the application of a poly Z gate to negate the coefficient on front of the basis vector one, and then apply a second Hadamard gate finally following that with a measurement. And we should find the qubit to be in the state one. So here we are with a fresh quantum score. Let me start off by applying a Hadamard gate to this first qubit. And then let's just confirm that things behave how we think they should. So I'll follow this with a measurement. And what we would expect to see is that we will measure the qubit to be in the state zero with probability one half and we'll measure it to be in the state one, also with probability one half. And indeed, that's what we see, one half for both states. Now, what happens if we follow the Hadamard gate with a poly Z gate? So as we talked about, now the state we're in is one over root two, zero minus one. And I said that if we make a measurement, we should see the same thing that we saw before we added the Z gate. Namely, the probability of the qubit collapsing to the state zero is one half, which means the probability of it collapsing to the state one is also one half. And indeed, that's what we see. So we need to do something besides just making a measurement. Measurement alone won't let us tell the difference between just applying the Hadamard gate and applying the Hadamard gate followed by the Z gate. Fortunately, we know the solution. Solution is to apply another Hadamard gate. So let's do that in this case. And we said now we should measure the qubit to be in the state one with probability one, because that's the state it's in prior to measurement. Um, and good, that's what we see. Um, so let's confirm that this approach also works to differentiate this state from the state where we never applied the Z gate. So now we should find the qubit to be in the state zero with probability one. And that is what we see. In the case where we apply the Z gate in between the two Hadamard gates, I wanna look at what happened more closely because it mimics what Grover's algorithm does. We started in the state zero, then we applied a Hadamard gate to get into the uniform superposition. And I'm gonna make a plot of this. I'm gonna put the 
basis states on the horizontal axis, and I'm going to put the coefficients in front of those basis states on the vertical axis. And because we're in the uniform superposition, those coefficients for both states are 1 over root 2. The next thing we do is apply the poly z gate, which here is acting as the oracle, to negate the coefficient on front of the basis state x star, which here is 1. And now we're in a state where the square of the amplitudes of both of the basis states are the same, namely 1 half, but the coefficient on front of the basis state 1 is negated. And the final thing we do is apply another Hadamard gate, and this has the effect of increasing the amplitude of the basis state 1 at the expense of decreasing the amplitude of the basis state 0. And this has to happen. If the amplitude of one state increases, it comes at the expense of the amplitude of another state decreasing because our states in quantum mechanics have to be normalized. So now when we make a measurement of the system, we're guaranteed to find it to be in the state 1, uh, which is x star. Now I'm finally in a position to give you a sketch of Grover's algorithm using similar charts to the ones I just used. We start in the uniform superposition, so all basis states have the same coefficient, 1 over root 2 to the n. Then we apply the oracle to the uniform superposition, and this negates the coefficient on front of the basis state x star. And then we're going to apply some special operator. I'm going to call it D. And it's going to behave similarly to how H behaved in our previous example. That is, it's going to increase the amplitude of the basis vector x star at the expense of decreasing the amplitude of all other basis vectors. And then we just continue doing that. We apply O and then apply D. And each time we do that, we increase the amplitude of the basis vector x star and decrease the amplitudes of all other basis vectors. So if we do this enough times and then make a measurement of the system, we'll find it to be in the state x star with some reasonable probability. Now, of course, this isn't totally rigorous and I haven't even told you what the operator D is. I just want to give you a sketch here. In a future video, we'll dive much deeper into how this works. There's actually another way to think about this process. It's more geometric if you tilt that way. And that is to visualize these amplitude flips as rotations. So because all basis vectors besides the basis vector x star have the same coefficients throughout this process, we can say that our state lives in this plane spanned by the uniform superposition and the basis vector x star. We start off in the uniform superposition, and then after applying the oracle O, we're reflected across this horizontal axis here. So the uniform superposition, but with the coefficient in front of x star negated. And finally, the effect of this operator D is to do uh, another reflection, but this time about the uniform superposition itself. And you can see that now we end up being much closer to the basis vector x star. And the intuition here is that the closer our state vector is to the vector x star, the higher the probability of finding the system to be in the state x star is upon measurement. So like before, we continue reflecting our state vector about the horizontal axis, followed by another reflection about the uniform superposition. And each time we do this, we get our state vector closer to the basis vector x star. And at some point, we make a measurement, and hopefully we'll find the system to be in the state x star. Again, if this is a little fuzzy, that's totally fine, because it is fuzzy. I'm going to go into more detail in future videos that look at both of these interpretations of Grover's algorithm and do some analysis on them. To summarize, 
Grover's algorithm begins with all qubits in the state zero. It puts them in the uniform superposition, and then it successively applies the oracle followed by this operator D called the Grover diffusion operator. It does that some number of times R, and finally we make a measurement. And the idea is that after applying O and D to the uniform superposition R times, the resulting vector is approximately equal to the basis vector X star. So when we make a measurement, we should find the system to be in the state X star with some reasonably high probability. And finally, let me give you the Grubber diffusion operator D so we can talk about it in the future videos. So D is just equal to two times the projection onto the uniform superposition minus I, where I is the identity transformation. So I acting on any vector X leaves that vector unchanged.